Now, joining me now to run through all the top stories is former governor, government advisor Claire Pearsall and political commentator Esther Krakow. Thanks so much for being with me this morning. Look, let's start with this first story. Um, Esther, perhaps first with you. Uh, this is a pretty amazing splash, isn't it, on the front page of The Telegraph. The yeah. government's counter-extremism czar saying that London has become a no-go area for Jews. I, I think he was quite diplomatic in, in how he said it, because I would actually expand it to many pockets of the country are actually a no-go zone for Jews. And I think the pro-Palestinian protests have kind of Take, like, the, the cat is out of the bag now for many people that have actually ignored the fact that we're living with people in this country that are incompatible with British values. And I think it's an uncomfortable reality that we've had to face because we don't understand that it's actually possible for people to go out to the streets of the capital and shout anti-Semitic, hateful things and think, is this actually Britain? How is this possible? How are we living in 2024 and people are so brazenly doing that? And actually, it's the fact that we've ignored the, the, the reality that there are certain people living amongst our midst that are not buying into what it takes to actually live in British society, which is buying into British values. You can have political views, but when, once you tread into the territory of actually uh, advocating for the murder of someone just by virtue of, of their religion, their race, their identity, then you, you, are, you are stepping the line. And these people should never have even been here in the first place. But unfortunately, this is where we are. I mean, some of these businesses that are along the route of a lot of these pro-Palestinian protests, they, they are, they're having to close down on days when these protests are happening because they just cannot function because they're terrified for their own lives. There, there are young people in London that say, you know, I cannot wear my religious markings because I'm terrified that I'll be persecuted in London. And I suspect when you go to more ignored corners of the country, sort of in, in areas where communities are far more, even, even more self-isolating, it's probably just as bad. What do you make of this, uh, Claire? I think he's saying uh, out loud what has been known within the Jewish community now for some time, certainly for the last five months, that it, to be Jewish in London is spectacularly difficult and people are afraid. And yes, I, I, I do understand your point about extremism and people being allowed to, to do these protests and integration. And I think there yeah. is a wider conversation to be had about integration into the United Kingdom. A lot of the people on these marches are actually here we, when you sort of see some very white middle class well. British people taking up the cause that they don't actually understand and they don't know what it is they're backing. Do you think they don't understand it? I do, actually. I think there is an awful lot of, we are going to take this piece of information, we see the humanitarian problem in Gaza, right. which is not a, you know, that is a reasonable position to hold. Do they understand what Hamas is? Do they understand what the rise of a terrorist group looks like? I'm not so convinced. But the thing is, those people, I don't, those people don't bother me as much because I, I don't think they have any sort of strong men, like, convictions behind what they're saying. So they're easily swayed. If you can be swayed in this direction, you can be easily swayed elsewhere. I'm talking about self-isolating groups in this country that foster and harbour these extremist views that are not That's... that are not acting because it's you know the core celeb or the, the, the sexy thing to, to advocate for. They genuinely hold these destructive, hateful views, and they are they are existing in enclaves in this country, and they haven't integrated or bought into the idea that actually when you're in Britain you accept British values. But I think the problem is that yes, there are those groups absolutely, and they don't speak English because there's no need to. Uh, they can go to the doctor and the dentist and the shop on the corner and speak in their own language because that has been allowed to, to happen. But I think we have to be really careful at demonising everybody from a certain community mm. in with those who hold those extremist views. And that is what has unfortunately been happening in the United Kingdom, that everybody that happens to be of the Muslim faith has now been charged with that brush. Do you think they have? I, I really do. Well, you've seen it. The amount of Islamophobia that we have seen on the streets of London. Where's that? Outside the Houses of Parliament. The thing, the thing is, 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 Islam, Islam, I've seen. Islam, I, I, I think you've uh, seen other. Oh, well, the thing yeah. is, but the thing is, if you if you look at the biggest critics of, of these kinds of where the, the hotbeds of these extremist ideology come from, the biggest critics are actually other like moderate Muslims, yeah. because a lot of social and this is not necessarily a religious issue, but if you look at a lot of social data, actually these views are coming from groups of people that have actually not integrated properly into the United Kingdom. Many mm -hmm. of them can't drive. Many of them, you know, don't adopt. Well, can't speak the language, many of them are able to coexist or have parallel lives alongst other communities yeah, yeah. That, that are not necessarily white British. You can, they can, they tend to uh, coexist alongside, you know, uh, black Asian, uh, black African communities, uh, well, 
black British communities, but well, African British communities, yeah, yeah. Caribbean, all of that. So these are the kinds of groups that actually, you know, we, we need to be discussing why why these ideologies are allowed to exist and foster within these communities. But and I don't think that's necessarily necessary. No, no, no. And, down and, to and religion, I think it, but it, it does matter. I think religion plays a part of it. Yeah. And, I, and I think that um, places of worship across the country need to look at extremism course, yeah. and they need to be a little bit more savvy as to what is happening within those communities and, and to call it out you know, and be I mean, absolutely be bolder at calling it out. It's, it's strange. I mean, some of this discussion feels like uh, just a time warp to me. <laughs> I mean, we had this discussion about fundamental British values 20, 20 years, years ago. ago. And when Blair said it. When Blair mm -hmm. said in 2005 the rules of the game are going to change. Yeah. Gordon Brown. I remember him, uh, spent a lot of time, actually, to his credit, talking about, you know, fundamental British values and this sort of thing. How are we 15, 20 years later and we're still having this discussion? Because we've ignored it, uh, because we've allowed ourselves to be stifled by people that are unwilling to, or uh, not mature enough to actually have, to engage yeah. in this conversation. We've allowed ourselves to be silenced by people that are, are wanting to shout racism or discrimination or, or whatever at every corner. The reality is we all have to live together and we all have to have a set of values and ideals and an identity that bind us together. If you are unwilling to take part in that discussion, you need to leave. And we should have said that for a very long time. I don't care where you go, but go where you are more comfortable because you cannot live in British society and not buy into certain British values. But, that was the, but, it never gets got to the bit where you need to leave. But yeah, but, but well, well, Esther, I mean, look, this, this this country has spent years now trying to keep one girl who joined ISIS yeah. out of the country, and it has taken up endless yeah. hours in the courts and so on. And that's. That's somebody who joined ISIS, yeah. you know. I mean, I know she says she sort of didn't know what she was getting into, she and she groomed, thought she was yeah. going on a holiday and didn't. Yeah. I mean, we can all we can all accidentally join a head hacking uh, jihadist group accidentally. Of course. I'm sure yeah, it's yeah. happened to all of us. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's that's <laughs> with an abs that's with an absolutely clear cut case. Mm. I mean, I mean, what we're talking about here is people who seem not to sign up to British values, as we now call them, and much more. But what on earth do you do with them? But the problem is that we can't have a conversation about it. Well, we're the three having of it us now. Are, yeah, the three of us are having a balanced conversation. Unfortunately, you take that outside, you take it into Parliament, it goes horribly wrong. Yeah. That yeah. kind of conversation goes okay, bad. Okay, now why because is have, that? But hang on, but why is that? Why is that? I think there is a lot of pressure that's behind some MPs. I think that has a part to play in it. I think also just the, the sheer subject. People want to be very careful with what they say, so they end up saying nothing at all, with a lot of words to say nothing, as we've seen from a lot of politicians. But also nobody wants to call out the behaviour, extremist behaviour, on both sides of the spectrum. Well, where are the both sides of that, though? Because I hear this a lot. I heard this in the Rishi Sunak speech last yeah. Friday. He kept on talking about both sides of it. Look, we all recognise that if, if it is the case, as a, even the counter-extremism advisor to the government has said, that, it, that London is basically a no-go zone for Jews, well, we know what's driving that. It's a, it's a hardcore, mm -hmm. very, very driven Muslim ideologues on the streets, some of whom openly support Hamas, yeah. which is a prescribed terrorist group. And then, as you say, there are the people coming along with them, some of whom don't know what they're chanting. And one video of one of the guys the other day at the protest is this white, sort of sandal-wearing young guy. Yeah. And, he, and there's somebody said, what does your banner mean? And he said, oh, I don't really know. And they said, well, well, where did you get it? Oh, that guy over there gave it to yeah. me. I was like, what? Yeah. Who yeah. goes down the street with a banner that just some other bloke's given them? Anyhow, those people aside, nevertheless, you said both sides of it. Where is the other side of that? Like, where is, the, where is this Where is, where the is this? Side? Where is this kind of far-right thing? Yeah. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. We know that there are pockets of, like, there, there are, like, very nasty people in the woodshed. We know that with the murder of Joe Cox. Yeah. But... There's no organised movement on the other well, side, is the there? The thing is, they're so well, they're so small, they're negligible. That's there are both sides, but the, the reality is, you if you if you give equal weight to the, the the kind of the other side when when we don't necessarily see it on the data, unless you're like following bots on Twitter, it it makes it seem like you're unserious about tackling the issue. And the politicians want to seem balanced. They want to seem like, oh yes, we're saying we're, we're giving the we're, we're yeah. wagging our finger at all the naughty kids, right? Yeah, yeah. But but the thing is, we know the writing on the wall. We can actually see in our daily lives that actually one group, one side, far outweighs the other, and in orders of magnitude to almost to render the other side insignificant. But I do think it's also about organisation. Well, yeah. And I don't think necessarily that a far-right organisation, you know, of which there are a few, they're not as organised. And I think it is the sheer number of people coming out on the street. It is the 
volume at which they are speaking yeah. and yeah. the problems that they are causing in certain areas. And you tend to forget then all of those other groups on the other side. My, my son goes to school in Dover and Doverport obviously gets a lot of attention with the migrant crossings mm -hmm. and you get an awful lot of those far right groups protesting within the town. When it's not advertised as much on the press. Is it that, it is isn't that far as right large though, number. Or is that... Because uh, that's the thing, what yes, is, they, what well, is far right mean? Well, yes, so, yes, but the thing I is, really even, is. If, even if it was, I don't know, me and my relatives, right? You know, black West African British people on the coast of Dover saying actually we don't want these these boats coming across because we don't these are unvetted mainly young men does that make us far right I no, mean that doesn't but they are um, belonging to a group which they are very proud to to say when they're out on the street and which group is that you're talking about? It, it is the EDL mm. and they have had banners out there and you know and this is where I'm going to get you know a load of people sort of saying well they've perfectly you know allowed to express their views absolutely they are but they're not allowed to go and intimidate a group of Teenagers well, in a town centre. Yeah. No, yeah, sure. That, that's, I mean, that's I've agreed true. on that. But I mean, you know, you, we have, as I say, tens of thousands, sometimes yeah. hundreds of thousands of people on the streets of London every week and who that's are, what I mean are intimidating yeah. people. Yeah. And they actually are, as Esther said, they're, they're closing businesses. If you have a business on Oxford Street, your main trading day every week, the Saturday, your business yeah, is wrecked. Yeah, exactly. I mean, some of them are actually yeah. closing the shops. Anyhow, I mean, I, well, we must move on. But I, I find this kind of on the one hand, on the other with this. You know, the risks are not the same. And uh, even the government's uh, prevent reviewer, he said that. He said that the other month mm -hmm. when he delivered his review. He said, he said, there is a threat from the far right. There is a threat from the Islamists. But they are not of the, the same, same scale. Yeah. Anyhow, look, moving on. Uh, you might have noticed uh, that last night, uh, President Joe Biden gave mm. his State of the Union address. Uh, let's just have a quick clip from that now. Now it's we who face an unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is the freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas. What did you make of this? No, it's... All right, let's just put to one side the general health of President Biden. I think there are some really important points that he makes, especially when he looks at uh, Ukraine and Russia. And if we don't continue to help Ukraine, then that puts Europe at risk. And I do think that this is a really valid point, mm -hmm. that we cannot stop supporting Ukraine against Russia. But I think, you know, America has a lot of skin in the game with this. They are not blameless. And it's very nice to go preaching from the safety of the United States when I'm not seeing the negotiating power of America solving any problems and that's what they've always put themselves there to do is yeah. to negotiate and to be a peacekeeper and it isn't working well the the whole world looks at biden americans at home the, everyone else abroad and we just see weakness it's just mm. weak a weak man and a weak man in a scary world is even scarier because ev then everything is at is, is at risk i don't think this whole shtick of democracy being attacked that's that's been a de democrat line for years now that was the line that that, that effectively yeah. um bought him the white house it's no longer working because if this is what this if this is what democracy not being under attack looks like, I'd rather go back to, to Trump. That's what many know, people are thinking. But but let me just throw one thing out there because I, I was struck whenever I see a State of the Union address by uh, Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. In fact, whenever I see him give an address, pretty much, if he gets through the whole thing, everyone says, "Well, it's all yeah, it's exactly, all right." Yeah. And I mean, my point <laughs> is, is that in a way, Republicans in the U.S. and elsewhere, and his critics, which he's, he's got a lot of at home and abroad. Um, they, they make it so, they emphasise so much his inability to just get through things, his stumbling, yeah. his fumbling. I'd argue Joe Biden's always been like that uh, through decades yeah. as a senator. He was famous, famous. And as Vice President Obama said this, famous for sort of rambling on, losing his train of thought. Yeah. That's sort of, that's Biden at his peak. So when people say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a tricky, it's been a tricky period, he's deteriorating and much more. Don't you think that like this is people like you, Esther, when you say this, you, you talk it up so much that if he just gets through the speech, if he just reads the auto cue, yeah. he's like, well, actually, he's all right. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, th there's no there's no getting around the fact that this is an old doddering man and he's clearly not very impressive. He doesn't walk into a room and command it. I think the main focus should be on the content of what he yeah. manages to get out to say if he, if he manages mm -hmm. to, to, to form coherent sentences. That's what worries me. Because even if you had a doddering old man that was actually saying something that connects with, with the average American person and makes them even, even feel like they're remotely aware of what, what they're going through, that would be a lot better. But for him to just say vague platitudes like, oh, our democracy is under attack. It's a, it's well, a really convenient headline exactly. to have. It's, but it's also empty and it's meaningless. But, and, I, and some of the really important things that he did say were at the end and not very many people have covered. And it's, it's talking about overturning Roe v. Wade yeah. judgment that, that had gone through the courts. And I think things like that are really, really important. What it does unfortunately happen though is it, it's got buried under this sort of rhetoric and the headline grabbing of you know democracy is it threat and we must do better and you kind of think well you've been president now for some considerable period of time why, 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 why now yeah. do you why think, now are you putting all of this effort into it and do you think Claire, that the, the uh, picking up things like roe v wade i mean that was the, the, that mm -hmm. supreme court judgment on on abortion in the u.s uh, that actually did have a huge impact on the republicans yeah. in the midterms um, do you think that's still going to be a galvanising issue at the presidential election in November? Yeah, I absolutely do. I can't see that people are going to let this go. When you've mm. got states where it is illegal, you've got people then going to... Illegal to have an abortion. Illegal to have an abortion. And also now looking at the fact that IVF is considered in some states to to be against the Constitution, to be against everybody's human well, rights. I mean, even fertilising eggs is now... Yeah. Is now um, a... And I find but... this just sort of... This grinding down of women's rights in America land of the free to be appalling. And I think that women aren't going to let that go. Strong women especially aren't going to let that go and it will be is, a it, big issue. It, it, it ma what matters is how it will play out electorally. So yes, it's an important issue, but for who? And who, yeah. who is it going to be a top issue for? I mean, are really urban, sort of elitist, educated white women going to change the vote to Republican on based on any other issue, right? They're already, they're already Democrat voters. He's already they're, got them in ex the back. Exactly. The people that will care about Roe v. Wade are already Democrat voters anyway, the, the vast majority well, of them. So I don't know if it's enough of an issue to swing the pendulum. Well, let I me just get, on, let me get oh. on an issue that might swing the pendulum for them. The Democrats uh, are also, of course, coming under some pressure domestically over the president's attitude towards the Israel-Gaza war, the Israel-Hamas war. Uh, he did say in the Save the Union last night that the US is going to uh, build a port to increase aid to Gaza. Is this the sort of thing that you think is going to satisfy the Democrat base? I think this is some really, really dangerous ground, in yeah. fact, huh. because I, President Biden has always said there would not be American boots in Gaza. Well, they're However, not going to be on the ground. No, they're they're going, going to be on the port. They're going to build a pier. Yeah, they're going to be on the pier. Boots on the pier. It, it feels a little bit like he's failed in every other way. This is the only way that he can make some difference. I, this, I this, is also, this is also a massive failure because he's undermining an uh, ally. He, yeah, <laughs> he absolutely is. Well, and I don't see what he is. I mean, yeah, OK, humanitarian aid needs to get in. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. But building a pier putting American troops out there, this feels even more inflammatory. As, as you say, goes against the, the advice of all your allies. What is and this also going the to achieve? Optics, the optics are terrible because having, just seeing people running, seeing these Gazans yeah. running into the ocean, trying to get like sort of aid boxes. It's, a t it's terrible optics. And apparently this, this port is going to be operational in a couple of months. So now there's mm. a question mark. What about this great ceasefire you were, you're, or this the yeah. humanitarian pause he was touting? Is that not going to happen now if this is going to be operational in a couple of months. How long is the fighting? Are you expecting the fighting to last? Which I mean, goes back to, exactly. to my point and, about and then the, the You're also un undermining your position or well, his support for Israel because on the one hand, you're supporting them, but you're undermining them by yeah. effectively circumventing um, them and saying they're frustrating humanitarian aid efforts, so we're going to go around them, but we're still supporting them. It's a completely haphazard yeah. I, policy. I have to say, and I, I agree with Claire. I mean, there, it is, it's very interesting for a president who has prided himself on not getting American troops mm. involved yeah. in foreign conflicts. You know, the amazing thing about this is, I mean, they've done airdrops of aid. There is a significant amount of aid still going into Gaza. But uh, the amazing thing about this is, of course, that the minute you do actually put American troops, any troops, mm. anywhere, even peacekeeping troops, of course, mm. They can only go in to a theater of operations if they are 
able and willing to fire. Yeah. Yes. And this, this is one of the things that's very, very striking to me about this, you know, because we saw the other day with one of the aid trucks that went in, Hamas ended up, or quite often just nicks the aid trucks and takes it for themselves. Uh, there was a big shooting incident still uh, being argued over, but it seems that Hamas opened fire on some of the civilians, maybe some civilians opened fire. If you put American troops into yeah. Gaza, even a few feet in, even on, in, the, uh, in the water, as yep. you say, Esther, um, if, if you have people flooding towards American troops and if some of those people are threatening danger in any way, then those troops are going to have to fire. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, a, it's, it's completely... But again, this, this goes back to the overarching point of Biden's presidency, which is weakness. Weakness and inconsistency. And unfortunately, you cannot... People are not going to tolerate that for much longer. You cannot say, oh, but just tolerate that, deal with my weakness and inconsistency mm. because democracy is under threat. I'm sorry, yeah. the other guy looks like a better option. Thank you, uh, Esther.